I'm at Station 19E again to go back and do this 14.8 um, into uh, coming back here from Carver's Gap. Um, chef's not feeling well, so I will be doing this by myself overnight, and uh, which is not a problem, and I'm just waiting right now for my ride, which should be here any minute to take me up to Carver's Gap. Back at Carver's Gap again. Deja vu. Deja vu. The only difference is that today I am solo. But tomorrow I will officially be out in North Carolina. And it's chilly up here. It's in the 40s up here right now. So a little bit cold. But I'm sure... On the ups over these balls, I'll warm up. Clouds are burning off, and blue skies in my future. All right, let's get to hiking, y'all. So if you remember on my last video, when we were walking through this piney forest, and, uh, you know, I thought it was so strange because he had dropped off at Carver's Gap, and it's open, and then you walk on the other side of this, and it's just open balls for miles. So, um, I'm gonna tell you the story behind this. So Cindy, who was my shuttle driver, told me the story behind this pine forest from, that you enter after you come up from Carver's Gap um, up to the balls. So I guess there was a professor at ETSU who wanted to study why uh, trees don't grow on the balls. So this forest was planted in here and, uh, and it grew. However, the trees that are in here are sterile. Hence the reason why you don't see any little, it, it'll never thicken up as far as the pines go. And you don't see any little offshoots growing. Oops, sorry. Um, so they still don't know why the trees are sterile and they still don't know why the trees don't grow balds. Um, so as these trees in here, as far as the, the pines go, once they die off, then this forest will just disappear. And, you know, I was said to Chef the other day that this was so strange because I see like, if I walk over here to this one right here, you know, and you can see on the trees. I mean, these are just, anything low is just so bare. Uh, it doesn't grow anything. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's the story behind this beautiful little forest that you're blessed to walk through when you first get dropped off at Carver's Gap until you get to the bald. So there you go, and now you know. guy's just up here this little guy he's just running 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 oh he found a warm spot oh he had to go down that little edge of rock so 
So here we are again, Jane Ball, elevation 5807. So the story of Jane Ball, according to Cindy the shuttle driver, is um, Jane drank some milk from a cow and the cow had apparently eaten something that was poisonous. Uh, I don't know what it was. I haven't looked up the story she just told me, but apparently the cow ate some type of grass, weed or whatever that was poisonous. And then when Jane drank the milk, she died and she died here. And hence the reason why Jane's bald is named after Jane. So there you go. Look at me. Look at me getting all like knowledgeable along the AT. <laughs> I can't research and get more facts when I'm standing on the mountain, but hey. <laughs> Clouds are moving today. It's breezy up here, but it's beautiful. The weather is just perfect. Absolutely perfect. There's Jane Bald. So we've gone over Round Bald, Jane Bald. One more bald, Grassy Ridge. Y'all have a great hike. All right, this is where we lose you. <laughs> Thank you. I call this the grandfather tree just because he's massive at the bottom. I'm sure he's endured a lot of storms. The weird thing is, is that that looks like a face, like a pig nose. Can you imagine coming around the corner, night hiking, and seeing that silhouette? It's really pretty in here. I'm almost to the shelter where Chef and I hung out, I should say, during the storm. But I just had a thought, you know, because I've watched so many people, you know, on YouTube vlog their hikes or, you know, and then and also vlog their their challenges that they have during their hike or before or after. And I'm by far an athlete, but everything that I'm doing right now is good for me, right? I'm drinking lots of water. I'm getting a lot of activity throughout the day. I'm getting vitamin D. Well, sometimes it does filter through. And uh, I mean, obviously on the balls, but then again, I feel like it's so funny because our bodies get into this comfort zone. And when we rest in that comfort zone for however long, days, weeks, months, or years, and then we try to break out, get our body to break out of that comfort zone and challenge it, it really just wants to fight back. It really, really, really wants to fight back. And I mean, if, if you have been blessed with somebody that has always, you know, been athletic and, um, you know, or slim, not had a lot of illnesses and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, man, I, you're so lucky. But for somebody like me that, you know, has had weight up, weight down, you know, health up, health down. And now I feel like I'm doing all of these good things for me but I really, really feel my body trying to resist what I'm doing. And I think that's why when some people say to me, you know, that I'm, I had one lady, you know, say my trail name should be Tenacious, you know, cause obviously I went off, I came back, you know, I've been off for two days cause I fell again and here I am back. But really, I just honestly believe that if I just stick with this, like, one more day, one more day, one more mile, one more hike, that at some point my body is going to get the message that I am not going backwards. I'm moving forward in the next phase of my life and damn it, you're coming along with me. So that's my just my two cents right before I get to the shelter and eat a lot of sodium infused food for lunch. <laughs>
I guess the point that I'm trying to make is anybody that's out there that's doing anything in life that is where you're trying to better yourself and you feel your body like your body or your keep if you can keep your head in the game you can get your body in the game or you know even getting your head in the game you got to be just as stubborn with that I know I have to be just as stubborn with that because every time I you know have hurt myself I'm like maybe I shouldn't be doing this maybe I shouldn't be out here maybe I just need to go home and do something else um so the the mind is just as important but you know just really wanted to throw some encouragement out there just keep moving forward don't let don't let those stupid thoughts come in and push you backwards you know when you know in your heart of hearts that what you're doing is the right thing for you that's it. That's my two cents. Let's go, y'all. We got this. Here I am back at Stan Murray. <laughs> oh, it's just too funny. There I am. There's my signature. He's so engaging. <laughs> so awesome. They're not all like that, but no in social. <laughs> Look how pretty this is in here. So lush and green and Birds are singing. And the acoustics. Great acoustics out here. Look at these pretty wildflowers I just stumbled on. Just a few of them right here. There's some more buds, so more are gonna bloom. So this is Yellow Mountain Gap. It was established in 1780. Sorry for the reflection of the leaves, but September 25th, down yonder at Sycamore Shoals, they gathered a thousand men from the militias of Virginia, North Carolina, and what is now Tennessee, joined forces to resist the British. This army of independent over mountain men provided their own horses, rations, and guns. On September 27th, they rode up this mountain as the weather turned bitter. Through this gap, they trudged with the snowshoe mouth deep. Without benefit of supply wagon, surgeon, or chaplain, the Overmountain men continued the 170 miles to King's Mountain. There they defeated the British led loyalists in a bloody battle. They won a significant battle of the Revolutionary War. Hmm. Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Oh. One more little climb up to the top of Little Hump Mountain. So the summit is about oh, 5,445 feet. And Little Hump is no joke. I got one more up. I'm guessing maybe I'm going up there and then down and then uh, we're going to see if I'm going to do a 
do an 11 mile day today do a few more miles and go over a big hump today but wow look at how pretty that is and little hump and big hump will be my last 5,000 footers for a while at least, at least looking at my Damascus map but look at how beautiful that is the clouds right there yeah so there's my last bit over little hump see one of the other hikers about halfway up. Look at this. I mean, between the green and the blue sky and the clouds, what an amazing, amazing day. at the top of Little Hump. Pretty impressive Little Hump. I don't know if that one is Big Hump, but I'm thinking it looks like there might be trail way over the top. I gotta go down and, oh yeah, that's, that's it. That's gotta be Big Hump. Let me check my Alpine guide and then I'll come back and tell you. Yep, so that is Big Hump Mountain. 5,577 feet above the sea level. So we're on Little Hump. We're gonna go down and uh, and then head up and over that. to go over that. That's Big Hump Mountain. You can see the trail. There's a marker right there. It's just so crazy to me. It's not that I haven't uh, climbed, hike over mountains that are higher than that, but it's just a different thing when you can actually see. It doesn't have all the trees and you can actually see what you're getting ready to walk over. It's amazing. This is the Houston Ridge in memory of Stanley Murray. He was a f Houston Ridge has been dedicated by the U.S. Forest Service and the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy in memory of Stanley Murray. He's the chair of the Trail Conference from 61, 1961 to 1975, and instrumental in bringing the AT to the Highlands of Rowan. I mean, thank you, Stanley Murray. Oh, I still can't believe I'm standing here. All right, word to the wise. If you're thinking about doing Hump Mountain at the end of the day, and then you do a couple miles down into Doll Flats to camp, don't do it. Okay, because once I got off, it this is this is what the trail's been. It is the end of the day. It's been a long day. I'm freaking exhausted, and I'm just going down boulders. So. If I knew it was going to be like this, I would have stopped at the tent site. There was a tent site uh, right on the other side, a little hump, and I for sure would have would have stayed there. It's 6.30. I got like a half a mile left. It's painstaking, though, between the roots, the rocks, the descent, and being at the end of a long day. 
it's brutal. I'm pretty beat up. So, uh, you know, there you go. There's my, uh, there's my advice for the day, but I don't know. Some kid ran past me and said he was going to do five and a half all the way to station 19E. It was like almost five o'clock. So <laughs> there you go. It's all relative, I guess. All right. Let me get to camp. You see that little cabin down there? You see everything, all those rows of trees behind it. Uh, there's it over in this area. Um, that's Chris, their Christmas tree farms. All right there. <laughs> That's cool. All right, guess what's happening? I can't believe it. Look at this sign. Leaving North Carolina. I am officially done with day number two. I can't believe it. I feel like I'll look ridiculous, but I wanted to pop on here really quick and say good night. Um, I did 11.7 miles today. And the last, like, three and a half were tough. So I only have three miles tomorrow to do down to Station 19E to my car. I am at Doll Flats. It's actually a pretty nice, pretty nice spot. Um, <laughs> show you, like, what my legs look like after that 11.7. So I have both feet compressed, calves compressed, knee compressed, and hopefully... That will work everything out so that I can walk tomorrow. <clears throat>